Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Evidence Room. We're doing things a little bit differently this week. I am actually taking a few days off, but before I left, I wanted to let you know about a new segment we're debuting. My colleague, Zach Lashaway, has been working on something he calls the Z-Files. Zach has been doing a deep dive into unsolved murders that happened in disadvantaged neighborhoods. These are cases that did not get a lot of media attention and have since faded from the public eye. Zach wants to bring these cases back into the spotlight so he can hopefully produce some new tips which can generate some new leads for investigators and if all goes as planned, bring some long overdue justice to family members who've been waiting. So with that, I'll let Zach take it over and I will see you next week. This man has an eight to 10 year history of killing women all across the country. An employee coming in just after eight this morning made the horrible discovery. Four employees of the Malibu Grand Prix stabbed to death. She doesn't dispute that she stabbed her husband a staggering 193 times. Harris's 16-year-old daughter witnessed her stepmother run the wheels of her Mercedes over her dad several times. Police say the suspect may be responsible for the murders of at least six women. It's horrible. You just don't get over it. What if he was alive and I was the only one looking for him? Welcome to Z Files, where we're taking a closer look at cold cases within marginalized communities. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Zach Lajway. You know, right now there are more than 200,000 cold cases in this country. 6,000 cases are added each year. I had the opportunity to sit down with the sergeant in charge of the cold case division of Houston Police Department, and he tells me his agency owns more than 6,000 cold cases dating back to the 1930s. He says a majority of these cases are within minority communities. And so that really got me thinking, there's an appetite here. There's a way to talk about cold cases within marginalized communities that might not have gotten media attention at the time the crimes occurred. Those loved ones today might still be searching for answers because they did not get the attention at the time the crimes occurred. And that is where we start this segment. Our first guest, Annette Parson and Andy Kahn. Thank you both so much for joining us. You bet, glad uh, to be here. Thank you. Annette, I wanna start with you. I wanna go back to that day in 1992 and talk about what started as a normal day but ended as a nightmare. Okay. Well, um, I'm a nurse, and so I was working at Delora Hospital, and I was running late, and my son, Deshaun, his bedroom was on the first floor, and so I remember banging on his door telling him he needed to, to get up. No answer, but I, you know, I was in a rush and I left and went to work. And so I remember I kept, kept paging him, because you know, it was before, people rarely had cell phones then, you know. And, and I kept paging him and paging him. He never responded, which was unusual. And, and I just had this like, gut-wrenching feeling sick feeling in yeah. my stomach that something wasn't right and i was um telling my co-workers like you know sean isn't calling me back i paged him you know 911 and they were joking and said girl you know sean he's probably with some female right mm -hmm. but i couldn't shake that feeling and so I go home, I ask my husband and my sister, who was visiting at the time, had they 
saying, Sean, talk to Sean, and they said no. So I didn't have a house phone at the time, so I walked down a couple doors, called my daughter in Cincinnati, and I was telling her, like, um, have you heard from Sean? And she said, no, I haven't heard from him. And she said, do you think something has happened to him? And I said, yes, I do. And so she told me, call the police. Meanwhile, which I didn't know, um, the Texas Rangers, um, Brian Taylor, um, had called my mother's house in Cincinnati. And um, my daughter, Cheryl, answered the phone and she, they asked for my mother. And she, she said, well, she's not here and this is her granddaughter. And he said, she said, he, he, he said who he was and she asked him, is this about Sean? And he said, yes. And he asked her, was she alone? Was she home by herself? And he, she said, yes. And so Cheryl said, well, is he alive or dead? And <clears throat> Brian said, he's, he's dead. At this point, you're, you don't know. I don't know. Right. I was trying to hide my um, fear from my, my husband and everybody, right? And, um, and so Eartha walks in and she says, I don't know how to tell you this. And I was like, what? And she said, Sean is dead. And then at that same time, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, Texas Rangers, Brian, and I forgot the other one's name, were knocking on the door and my husband answered the door because it was like, you know, stunned, like, what? And, um, and that's when Brian came in and, um, you know, he, <clears throat> excuse me, he told us that how old was your son? He was 19. 19 at the time. Right, he had just turned 19 January 15th. And this happened? March. March. 15th when they came to the house. I last seen him March 14th. And, um, and then I, you know, I don't really, I just remember like being stunned 31 years later, mm -hmm. obviously still very emotional. Right. Does that, what does time do? Does time heal the pain? No. I've, I've learned um, how to suppress it. <clears throat> um, and hide, um, how I really feel, the, 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 the pain from my children, because I had two little ones at the time. You still gotta raise your two young children. Right, it's horrible, you just don't get over it. I was diagnosed with PTSD because of that. <clears throat> and you just, you know, go through the motions. I'm Catholic, right? <clears throat> Roman Catholic, but I haven't been to communion or a confession in 31 years. Why? Because in order to receive communion, you know, you go to confession, but I can't, I can't do that because I want him dead. The person per who the perpetrator killed right. your son. Right. Especially because you have you have no answers. I yeah. have no yeah. answers, yeah. and I feel like more than three decades. Three decades, and I feel like injustice hasn't been served. Right, and they don't care. I think 
um, and I've said this to the chief of uh, Texas Rangers that is, he feels to me like he's just a number, you know, which he may be to them, but he's my son. You know, they know who did it. They know. What's the holdup? It's circumstantial evidence. So I was told that if they take it to the grand jury and he's no build, they'll never be able to try him again, even if he walked out of the courtroom and said, yeah, I did it. Andy, I want to bring you in. You know, this is, this is unique for Annette. This is foreign to her. She's never had to deal with something like this. She never imagined she would be a stat, uh, a mother to a son murdered in his teenage years. This, however, though, is something that you deal with time after time after tell time you, for decades. You know, Zach, for 30 years, I've been a board member of Parents of Murdered Children and Surviving Family Members of Homicide. So I've worked and have met people like Annette under the worst possible scenarios that you can dream. It's the only organization in the country, quite frankly, in which someone else writes out your membership for you. Right. Nobody has to be part of this, of this group. So working with homicide survivors now for 30 plus years, you know, I've seen the different stages that people go through. And I can unequivocally tell you that grief is intensified when justice is lacking. And right now, like in Annette's case, you have justice lacking for hundreds, if not thousands, you know, of victims, not just in, in Houston and Harris County, but of course, all over the country. But it's important for me as a victim advocate because I've seen families and I've worked with families and I've also seen mm -hmm. cases resolved. Mm -hmm. And it's important to let them know that they still have a voice, mm -hmm. that their case we do care about their case. Uh, obviously, at Crime Stoppers, we care very deeply about unsolved cases. That's primarily what we do. And if you just keep putting it out there, putting it out, because I've seen miracles happen. Mm -hmm. And I've seen cases solved because we put it out there. And at the very right moment, at the right time, someone sees that clip. So, for example, someone might see this clip today that we're doing. And all of a sudden they might say, you know what? I remember what happened. Yeah. I do that. And we get answers. Is this something you see majority of these cases belong to uh, victims, loved ones within marginalized communities? You know, I went back and I looked at all the unsolved cases that we have on our Crime Stoppers website, and there's over 500 and basically around 700 if you include hit and run fatalities as well. And a majority of the cases that are unsolved are within the minority community. Why is that? I can't unequivocally give you answers to that. It's hard to answer. You have what we call front pagers and back pagers, and that's just sadly human nature. Some cases capture attention. Others are just like, well, this just happens every day in every part of town. But it, for the families, there's no difference between someone who the lost their loved the one, page, yeah. you know, whether it, it ends up on breaking news or never hits the news cycle. But it's frustrating for families to see some cases covered ad nauseum, and we have to fight to try to get some of our cases covered as well. Okay, I wanna stop right here. We're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna have more on Annette's story coming up. Welcome back to Z Files. Earlier you brought up technology and I'm really glad you brought that up, Andy, because if you, you know, it is, it's, we live in a whole new decade and t DNA technology, I don't even know if it was around in 1992. It was at the infantile stages, really. Yeah. What does that do for these cold cases? Having access to this new technology, obviously the hope is to get answers for loved ones of victims of, of, of tragedy, of murder, of crime. Um, but what is, what is that doing for you as an advocate? It brings additional hope for families. 
And my position has always been we exhaust all options. And all options. All, and, and this is a brand new option that's available. So let you know what's the, the downside in using it. If it if you can't at least you can say we made the attempt. So it's kind of like and I use sports analogies a lot because oh, yeah. that's my background. It's like a boxing match. You know, a, a family's like a net. They've been knocked around. They've been you know pummeled, but we keep on getting back up. And now we have a new ven new ways that we can look at these cases and get news, uh, new eyes on them. And that's why you're seeing cases that are solved, you know, going back to the Golden Gate serial killer, you know, from 30 some odd years ago. You're being able to solve these cases now. So I think there's a renewed effort and I'm hoping that cases like Annette, there's again, uh, looking at it in a different venue and a different set of eyes, will at least let them know that we haven't forgotten about you and your family. Absolutely. Annette, does evidence exist in your son's case? Yeah, they, I mean, they still have his clothes, his pager. They already know he wasn't murdered where he was found. He was dumped. Mm. So, yeah, because he was, at 19, he was already like six feet. Um, probably 190 pounds. Big boy. Right. Mm. So it would take more than one person because mm. Sean, he wasn't like a little guy. Right. It, it took a minimum of two. You know, like in Annette's case, it's a giant, it's a puzzle. It is. And you've got a puzzle together. You've got pieces All that over. are there, but mm -hmm. you've got, you're looking for that one right. final nail in the wall the that you can put that in and right. say, we got it. Right. And now with the new technology available, again, I, I, I exhaust the options, see what happens and give some renewed hope. Do you recall if media was present in 1992 for Deshaun's murder? No, they weren't. Is this the first time you're sitting down to do an interview it regarding is. your son's murder? It is, yes. 31 years later, how does that make you away. feel? Uh, it makes me feel like his there no value is was is placed on his life. Um, like nobody cares how his murder affected not only his parents but his siblings his cousin, my mother, his grandmother. It's like nobody cares, you know, like like I said, it seems like he's treated as just a number. Andy, where do we go from here? By doing cold cases like this and bringing it back to attention with the new technology that's available these days, it's like night and day what happened when Annette's son was murdered in the 90s, <clears throat> you didn't have all these technological apps and aspects and ways to go and see who might have been there at that time, right. who might have been looking at time. You didn't have the cameras that are out there at this time. So there's renewed hope that's given to families that these cases can be solved. And I've seen these cases solved. I was with a family, it was almost like your 30 years it took. And 30 years, I'll never forget when they got that phone call. It, it, it was like humanity returned to them and I saw a different a face. That, and I really saw color come to that person's face. So I've seen it happen. So we keep, at Crime Stoppers, we keep trying to get these cases out there because you never know on any given moment. Annette, I know you over the years have held on to some of Deshaun's items. Uh, right. Photographs, documents. Mm -hmm. You also have a poem, a poem that took you two years to write. I wrote this in April 25th, 95, and I titled it A Mother's Pain. It's been three years, one month, and 10 days since you were murdered. Will the pain ever stop? I miss you. Tonight, I sit here still in disbelief and sickened heart you see, 
I never got a chance to say goodbye or to hold you one last time and tell you. I love you, Sean. Why? Because a murderer decided I shouldn't have that chance. He decided that not only should he murder you, but also to leave you in a ditch to be found by a bicyclist. Why did you write that poem? Um, because most days, the pain was so overwhelming. So I decided to put my feelings, what I was feeling, the pain I was feeling on paper. Who or what gave him the right to cause your family and friends this pain? Who or what gave him the right to decide your fate? Who? Your mom, in loving memory of Deshaun Hollins. 31 years later, when you look at that poem, when you hold that poem, how does it make you feel? I feel that same um, anguish comes back. I, re I, re I remember it like yesterday. It's consuming and it's like you have two faces, right? Like I said, I, I have this, I guess you can call it a facade for my family, especially my kids, because I don't want them to know how devastated it was. Like, it's like your heart was ripped out and you can't replace it. You know, I just want justice for my son. Yeah. It's the not knowing and it's every day you wake up and you wonder, why was my son, you know, what happened? What were the you know, circumstances that led up to? Was this somebody that he knew? Was it random? Yeah. And so I think, you know, for the most part, people would rather know and get answers than, you know, wonder and wonder what, you know, especially for decades. Well, my hope is that you do get answers. My hope is also to do more segments like this, to feature people who are in search of answers, for people who have lost loved ones due to crime and are still searching for those answers and getting those well, um, we appreciate you bringing so, renewed yeah. attention right. yeah, to these cases. And that's, you know, the public is our best eyes and ears out there, as I've always said. Right. And somebody out there knows something. Yeah. Everything starts with a conversation. And if we're talking about this today, hopefully someone, this will ring a bell with someone watching, someone listening, and they might know something. And if they know something, hopefully they'll say something. And the beauty of Crime Stoppers is you can contact us on 713-222-TIPS. You can submit a tip online, www.crime-stoppers.org. Use our mobile app in 20 languages, and you can be anonymous, and you can get up to $5,000 in a Nets case or any of the 700 plus other cases. Annette, I know it was extremely painful, and I thank you so much for sharing your story. Going there on that day is not easy, and so thank you very much for, for allowing us to tell Deshaun's story, I do appreciate it. And Andy, I always appreciate talking to you and with you and the work that you do, uh, the work that you've done for decades. And they saved my life, parents of murdered children. Yeah. Yeah. It's, as you said earlier, it's not a club that anybody wants a membership to. No. But sadly, it happened. Thank you both you so bet. much. Um, and thank you for tuning in to Z Files. Again, if you have a case that you want us to talk about that might not have been talked about when the crime happened, let us know. Coming up next week, how in the world did everybody wind up at this hotel at the same time in this parking lot? Well, that's kind of what one of the things that made this case so crazy. Thank you for calling, Mass Police. Police. Kimberly, how may I help you? You see, I'm a business operator, I'm hoping you can have a day Okay, and what's the problem there? Um, there's a lady, the girls, they're fighting here in the uh, uh, lobby. In the lobby? Yes, and how would you send somebody here? Could you tell us if you actually, if you did this and why you did it? It was an accident. He was what? It was an accident. 
Lake Jackson dentist Clara Harris did not mean to run over her husband repeatedly in the parking lot of a Clear Lake hotel, she says. This after she found Dr. David Lynn Harris in the lobby with a female ex co worker. Nassau Bay PD responded to a domestic disturbance in the lobby of the Hilton. However, the fight had moved to the parking lot. Harris's 16 year old daughter, seen in this picture with her dad and twin half brothers, witnessed her stepmother run the wheels of her Mercedes over her dad several times. Amy Davis will be joining Robert Arnold. They will be talking about Clara Harris on the evidence room. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Zach Lazway with Z Files.